see all of you today. Welcome back if you're out finding a parking place. Your extra hour of sleep got used up looking for parking today. For those that are our guests today, it's normally not like this, but when the president comes to town, he gets to park wherever he wants and we don't get to. And that's fine. It is great to be back, and certainly you've already heard a good bit about our trip to India, and in a couple of weeks we'll share more about that, but it was a great time for our uh, missionary journey. About 20 of us from the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ went over for about eight days and spent time with the churches in Delhi and in Hyderabad, and then of course there was a team camp that went off, so lots of great things that happened. And so uh, very, very encouraging things, and uh, like I said, we'll spend some time in the future talking about that. Uh, a little bit of uh, family business. I was made aware that uh, there is a new members meeting today. That wasn't announced earlier, so if you're uh, new to the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, we encourage you to be a part. It's downstairs at 1245 for about an hour, so make, uh, make your plans there. And then also, while we were away, we had the special missions contribution, and so we are well on our way, but I will say we're not there yet. And so we're going to be talking about that more in the future, but also putting that on hold right now because we do have the International Day of Giving coming up that we're very excited about, and we'll spend the next couple of weeks focused on that. And then lastly, I did want to say that we are in the, uh, in, in the thick of wedding season around here. And this has just been a very encouraging time for so many in the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. We have probably no less than 12 weddings that are taking place in a fairly short period of time. And in fact, next Saturday, we've got a double header. Yes, we have. Ed and Angie getting married in the morning. And we have Russ and Chi Chi getting married. Two very exciting weddings, and I think it's safe to say two very different types of weddings. And so it'll be a great, great time of celebration. And we just love weddings around here at Dover Church. And with that in mind, I've got something to read to you. <laughs> and the Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper for him. But for Adam, there was no helper to be found. And the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh in his place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from him, he made into woman. And he brought her to the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. On Saturday, October the 4th. Stephen Witten, our brother from Montgomery County Church of Christ in Maryland, asked our dear sister Mary Minutuali while looking at photographs that were taken over the course of the previous 19 months. As the last ray of the sun hit the beach, Stephen proposed marriage to him. As he made his proposal, he presented her with a symbol of his respect, love, and future commitment if she were to accept. Stephen looked intently into Mary's eyes, waiting anxiously for her response. After several seconds that seemed like a thousand years to Stephen, Mary accepted Stephen's proposal for marriage. Blessed day. We have been 
walking through the entire Bible, 2014. You can see up there, it's been the year of the Bible. We've taken 52... But my assignment as I came back today, as I got ready for this message, is the assignment of the death of Jesus. Not the death and the resurrection, just the death of Jesus. Josh Byrd has put it all together, and that's my assignment today. And I've got to say, that's a pretty heavy topic. Isn't it? That's a challenging thing to just focus on without focusing on the good news that follows. And yet I think and I, I believe that in the scriptures we'll see things that will challenge us, move our hearts, and call us higher in terms of our relationship with God. You know, death is something that we don't like to talk about. It is kind of ironic that we just had a uh, worldly holiday, if you will, Halloween. And, and, and I think it's safe to say that death is kind of the theme, isn't it? And, and, and for some reason, people uh, rally around it and kind of like to be scared. But if you really get serious about it, death is something that we just don't like to think about or talk about. It, it's fairly daunting. And it is, in some ways, the tipping point, the pinnacle, the point in time regarding biblical Christianity where Jesus goes from being a prophet, a teacher, a man that amazed the people to becoming the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Having just come from a country where Christianity is not the dominant religion, where you see a lot of Hindus, a fair number of Muslims, and just a lot of secular society in India, it does help to step away from our culture for a bit because you begin to realize that when it comes to Christianity, we have been so over-indoctrinated that we tend to forget what's really, really important. A lot of us in this room have been brought up going to church. A lot of us are very familiar with basic Christian doctrines. A lot of us recognize the symbol of the cross, and we don't think twice about it, do we? When really, if you, if you step back, and you just think about the cross itself. It was strictly an implement for torture and execution. We would think it a bit strange if somebody had a little gold electric chair around their neck or a guillotine. We would think that's a bit odd. And yet we've taken the cross and we've, we've kind of elevated it to the point of jewelry or a symbol, and we don't really remember and reflect on the seriousness and, and, and what took place at the point of the crucifixion. It's also something that we have disregarded regarding its power. The cross is very powerful. What happened to Jesus on the cross is very moving. And yet sometimes when you're around powerful things or great things over a period of time, you get kind of immune, don't you? You know, I wonder what it'd be like having a little house next to Niagara Falls, where every day when you got up to make your cup of coffee and you looked out the window, there was Niagara Falls. There's always there. This, this immense amount of power, this energy just spilling over this canyon and, and, and the beauty of it and the majesty of it. But you know, you're around it so much that you kind of forget. You get a little whole home. That's like people that get to travel to Hawaii on a fairly regular basis. On one hand, we might envy them. On the other hand, I wouldn't want to be that person. I don't want to ever get used to Hawaii. I don't want to ever get whole home. I mean, there, there, there comes a point where you've got to be able to step back and look with clear vision to see the power and the majesty. 
One of the things that we were able to do on our trip was we took our very first day because we knew pretty much everybody on our team that had gone to India would be jet lagged. And so we decided to spend as much of that day outside as possible. And so we took a long bus ride together with the staff of the New Delhi Church and we went to Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is. One of the great wonders of the world. One of the great man-made wonders of the world. And it is spectacular. It is amazing. It's just the, the architecture itself and, and the way as you stand, uh, kind of the place where everybody stands and get their, gets their picture taken, it almost seems to elevate. It seems to hover uh, over the horizon. It's, it's just amazing all the, all the, the, the foresight that the, the, the builders had and the, the, the detail and everything. It just blows your mind, the detail of the Taj Mahal. I do feel kind of bad, though, because there's another fairly nice building built fairly close to the Taj Mahal. I feel bad for the guy that built that building. I, I think probably if it was somewhere else, everybody would go, wow, that's a really a cool building. I like that. Look at the architecture. Look at the, I don't think anybody thinks about that. Because the Taj Mahal is so majestic. It's so powerful. It's so ornate. It's so amazing in terms of how it was built. But you know, at one time, the Taj Mahal was all but forgotten that it had been almost overgrown by vegetation and, and, and until the British came over, it was kind of to a point of neglect. And that's sometimes how we can get with the cross of Christ, where we get around it so much and we see it all the time that we forget the importance in what happened there that is in fact the pinnacle or the tipping point when it comes to Christianity. Let's go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. Because here's a fairly common reaction, certainly back in the first century, to the cross of Christ. Oh, Walter. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Verse 22. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. You know, it talks about that even back in Paul's day, the cross of Christ was foolishness, that it was weakness, that it was a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. What does he mean by that? A stumbling block. Foolishness. For the culture that, that Paul spent a lot of its time in, it was a predominantly Greek culture. And, and the Romans had significant influence. And so there was a lot of pagan ideas around, and, and certainly with the Roman domination, this idea of a king uh, not being victorious or being strong was crazy. I mean, if you know anything about the Caesars, they demonstrated their power. They sat on their throne. They got rid of their enemies. Victory for a king was overthrowing the other king. And so now in Christianity, we're talking about King Jesus. Who didn't overthrow anybody. Who didn't take a seat of authority on the earth. Who was humble and meek. Who was mild. Who was easygoing. Who cared about poor people who didn't have any material possessions of his own. And for the Greek culture, that's crazy. That's foolishness. What in the world? How can that guy be a king? That's where the Greeks were coming from. It didn't make any sense. But for the Jews, it was a stumbling block. They didn't get it either. They didn't get it because if you know anything about the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy in chapter 21, it talks about anybody that gets hung on a tree is accursed. 
I mean, that was just humiliating. That was, that was God's judgment. That this can't be the Messiah. He, he was too, too weak. He was too, uh, too humiliated by society to be the Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to ride in on a white horse and, and everybody was supposed to fall down and worship. And that isn't what Jesus did. And so the Jews didn't get it either. They didn't understand how this Jesus could be a king, how this Jesus could be a Messiah, how this Jesus was going to be the savior of the world because the cross just didn't make any sense to them. They didn't get it. Let's read the account of the crucifixion. Go over to Matthew chapter 27. And let's get the context of what's going on here. Verse 32, prior to the actual crucifixion, it says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusted God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Certainly not an hour of glory. Verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the whole land. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said he is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick. He offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. That's the crucifixion. That's what our Lord went through. An incredibly agonizing, physically torturous way to die. Once again, because so many of us have had it kind of sanitized in our minds, we don't take enough time to reflect on the physical abuse that Jesus went through on the cross. Not to mention the initial flogging that he went through. And then being basically strapped with the cross piece across his shoulders, dragging it through the streets on the way to Golgotha. What would happen is the Roman soldiers would take the prisoner and they'd take him to the place of the skull. That was the common sight for the crucifixion. And there would be the, the upright beam laying flat on the ground. The prisoner would arrive with the cross piece on his shoulders. Jesus, of course, had stumbled along the way. And Simon Cyrene was pulled out of the crowd and was forced to help Jesus carry the cross. And by the way, we scholars believe that Simon of Cyrene was later a member of the Antioch Church. You can study that out for yourself. That's pretty cool. But Jesus was thrown onto the back of the upright piece. The cross piece was fixed into place. And then the soldiers, in a very callous and uncaring manner, would just grab the wrist and hold it against the cross piece, and they would take the equivalent of a railroad spike. And they would find the soft place in the wrist between the bones, and they would simply hold down the wrist, and with a small sledgehammer, they would drive that spike through the wrist. Then they would go to the other side and do the same thing with the other wrists. And then they would go down to the feet. 
but it was important that they would bend the knees. And so they would flex the knees, put one foot against the other, and then drive another railroad spike-like nail through the arches of the feet. And so at this point, the prisoner is now crucified, but the cross is lying flat on the ground. The next step is the soldiers would locate a hole that was already dug, probably used in previous crucifixions. They would take the cross with the prisoner, impaled on it, drag it over the hole, and then they would begin to set the cross in an upright manner. And you can imagine as the cross went vertical, and as it began to straighten out over that hole, as soon as it lined up with the hole, the cross would drop probably about two feet until it hit the bottom of the hole and an incredibly searing pain would shoot through every nerve fiber of the prisoner. They would begin to hang there, knees bent, pressure on the nails in the wrist. The next thing the prisoner would begin to realize is that they couldn't breathe. Their lungs were being constricted by the muscles around the rib cage. They could not get enough breath, so not only are they fighting the pain that's in their arms and in their feet, but they're suffocating to death. And so what the prisoners would have to do at this point would be to push down on the nail in their feet and try to straighten their legs enough to release the constriction around the rib cage and get in some breath. They would do that, get the breath in, but of course the muscles would begin to spasm. They couldn't hold that position for very long, and so they would sink back down. Sometimes for six, eight hours, prisoners would go through this seesawing effect of up and down, fighting for breath, pushing up on the nails in their feet, pulling with the nails in their hands, trying to breathe, and then cramping up and slipping back down. That's what Jesus went through physically. That's the physical torture that Jesus went through. So often we see pictures of crucifixes or we see imagery, and it doesn't give you that, that picture, does it? It doesn't give you that image. It, it almost seems like Jesus is it's just waving around. We need to remember that, yes, the Son of God was also the Son of Man. That he was facing every physical torture that you or I would face in the same situation. He was feeling every ounce of pain. He was having every nerve ending screaming out in agony. Jesus was experiencing all that. And yet we've also got to remember that this is the same man that walked across the Sea of Galilee. That raised Lazarus from the dead. That healed the blind man. And the amazing thing as you think about what Jesus was going through physically is to remember that he had the divine power to stop it at any time. That he could have said, this is not worth it. I, don't have, I shouldn't have to suffer this way. And with one word, he could have been released from the cross. And yet he forced himself to stay there. It says they offered him wine with gall. It was actually an act of kindness. It was a way to alleviate some of the pain. It was a way of showing mercy to the prisoner. Jesus refused it. Jesus knew that down the road someone could say, well, you know, Jesus got a little doped up on the cross. You know, he didn't really experience it. He took some drugs. Jesus had the foresight, even in the midst of pain, to say that. That's just the physical suffering that he went through. He also went through emotional suffering. He went through emotional suffering as his friends deserted him. And as the crowd gathered around his feet to mock him. I think the words came out of, I know the words came out of the crowd that surrounded the cross, but I believe that really the words were Satan's words. If you are the Son of God, we've heard that before. When Jesus first started his ministry, Satan in the wilderness said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I believe it's the same voice. That Satan is saying, hey, hey, hey. If you are the Son of God, come down from this cross and all these people will become believers. Tempting, what did that mean? To not see it all the way through. To be feeling the emotional anguish 
of your closest friends, your allies, your partners in the ministry fleeing, running away. Nobody there to support you. And a band of mockers surrounding you to try and taunt you, tease you, and make you feel terrible. He went through emotional torture as well. But the other torture that he went through is what we see in verse 46 where it says, About the ninth hour Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not only did Jesus undergo physical abuse, not only did he undergo emotional torture, but he also had to deal with spiritual separation. That he literally was suffering spiritually. That the sins of the world were being placed on him at this point. And he was agonizing. And he was suffering under that. We'll talk some more about that in a few minutes. But that's what was happening on the cross. That's what Jesus was going through. Don't allow yourself to get so used to it to never see that, that pain, that suffering, the agony that he went through. Make sure that you fight to, to have that, even as we gather together on a regular basis to take communion. Think about the cross and what Jesus went through. Think also about the fact that this was foretold 700 years before Jesus was even on the earth. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet. And in verse 1 it says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It says he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one who men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him. And afflicted. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This was written 700 years for Jesus was on the earth. Verse 2, like a root out of dry ground, a virgin birth. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. Crucifixion wasn't even a matter of torture back in Isaiah's day. And then in verse 9, it says, with the rich in his death. And we know from the Matthew account in chapter 27, Josephus, or Joseph of Arimathea, was the one that offered his, his burial, his gravesite to Jesus. This is amazing. The fact that this was prophesied about the Messiah so long before Jesus came. You know, for a very long time, cynics and skeptics of Christianity made the obvious charge of, well, yeah, somebody just got in there and doctored up the scriptures. Someone added some bits to make it sound like this was talking about Jesus and about the crucifixion. And for a long time, there was no real good way to refute that. Until uh, in the 1960s, a little shepherd boy, ironically by the name of Muhammad, was tending his sheep in the desert wilderness and came across some caves and being a smart boy before walking into the caves he decided to throw a rock in there to see if any big animals were going to come running out and as he threw his rock he heard the breaking of pottery and he was curious about that and so he wandered in and found a mass collection of clay jars that had within them original manuscripts 
that have been dated and studied and looked at and preserved. But those are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And really, almost beyond question, they document and validate Scripture in terms of Jesus' day, and in particular, Isaiah 53. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls were making their tour, and they came to the Franklin Institute a year or two ago, and I enjoyed seeing the whole exhibit, and you learn a lot of things and see a lot of different artifacts, but I, in particular, just wanted to see the fragment of Isaiah 53, and there it was. Talking about the coming of the Messiah, prophesying about what Jesus would go through. Let's look at another one. Go to Psalm 22. You know, this is more informational today, but sometimes we just need to be reminded of the power that surrounds the cross and the death of Jesus. So many of us are quick to quote the 23rd Psalm, and we forget about the 22nd Psalm. It starts off in verse 1 with the very verse that Jesus quoted while he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer me. By night, and I am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. And you, our fathers, put their trust. They trusted in you, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were saved in you. They trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him now. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Sound familiar? Verse 9. You brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you've been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tear their prey. They open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax and is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like the potsherd. And my tongue sticks to, sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of, dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide up my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horn of the wild lions. And he goes on. Prophecies speak to the matters at hand, but also give a foreshadowing of what's to come. Certainly as these songs were written, they were dealing with an immediate situation. And even as Isaiah was writing his words, he was dealing with an immediate situation. But we can't help but read those passages and go, boy, that sure sounds like the cross. We can't help but, it, but, but see the detail. The evil band that has encircled them. They gloat. They, 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 they tear Jesus down while he's on the cross. They pierced his hands and his feet. They cast lots for his clothing. It's all way too specific to be chance or circumstance. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did all this have to happen? What's the point? Why would such a good man have to give his life? I think first of all we need to remember that he gave it up willingly. Sometimes we think, well, this was just some master plan and Jesus didn't have a say in the matter, but if you jot down John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He was willing to give it up. He was willing to let it all go so that we can be saved. 
Later on in John, in chapter 14, in verse 6, Jesus speaks of salvation and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus understood why he needed to die. Jesus understood the purpose for his life. There are a lot of other religious leaders in our world, and I think we need to show them some respect. Certainly they are good men and good women. And many good things have happened because of their lives and the way they live and their teachings. You know, it's interesting, about 500 years before Jesus, there was Buddha. About 500 years after Jesus, there was Muhammad. And there's been other leaders in between. But there is a profound difference between Jesus Christ and the reason why he came and all other religious leaders. There's a profound difference because we need salvation with God and we need a Savior that can save us from our sins. And no one else on the planet at any time in the history of mankind has been able to produce that. There is no other solution for sin. Back over in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? As he is quoting that 22nd Psalm, he was experiencing your sin and my sin being placed on him on the cross at that moment, at that time. He didn't sin, but he became that scapegoat. Yeah. He became that sacrifice. He became the one that God put in the place so that we could have salvation. If we look over to 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about this in verse 21. Speaking of Christ, he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin. When Jesus is suffering on the cross, his spiritual suffering has to do with the fact that he's taken on the sins of the world and consequently has to be separated from his Father in heaven. That is why he's agonizing. That is why he's undergoing torture and pain and suffering. The Jews understood this. And if you're familiar with Acts chapter 2, you'll know that after Peter preaches that first gospel message, and he makes it clear that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Jews that are gathered there on that Pentecost day were cut to the heart and they were stricken. They were panicked. They cried out, what should we do? Because they understood man is separated from God because of sin. And yet they ignored Jesus. They handed him over to the Romans. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven. Amen. That was the magic phrase. That, those were the words those Jews needed to hear. They, were, they thought they were doomed for all of eternity. They thought they were lost. But Peter said, no, your sins can be forgiven. Amen. But the message today is a death had to take place so that sin could be forgiven. Jesus had to die to be that bridge between man and God. He who had no sin had to become sin so that we could have the righteousness of God. Yes. That's the Christian message. That's what makes it unique and different from all other religions in the world. That we have a Savior that is able to take on sin. That defeated sin in the grave. That rose victorious. So what does that mean for us? If Jesus came and lived to die for us, then doesn't it mean we also need to die in order to have a relationship with God? Should a death have to take place? See, if we really understand the message of the cross and the need for Jesus to die, then it makes sense 
that for us to respond to that, a death needs to take place as well, right? But I'm here to tell you today that the religious world, the Christian world that we live in, has minimized that point to the point where they've gotten far afield from the Scriptures. You know, back to Acts chapter 2, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 for a minute. If you study the history of the early church, and you study biblical conversion, when Peter said, Repent and be baptized, you will realize that the people back then knew exactly what he was talking about. In Romans chapter 6, Paul writes to the church in Rome. And in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. There's a curious phrase. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We minimize the power of the cross and the death of Jesus in our religious world when we teach the false doctrine that become a Christian, to become a Christian you need to just say a prayer. You need to just accept Christ. You need to just invite him into your life. You need to just do a little thing and go your merry way and it'll all be fine. That's not what it teaches. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? The men and women of scripture that we read about, when they came to the point of them converting to Christianity, faced death. They knew that their old life was coming to an end. They knew that they had to take this very seriously. This was not just a little thing. This was not just a, 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 an altar call. This was not just a simple prayer. This was stepping up and getting serious about your life for the rest of your life. This is an unusual teaching in our day and age. And we realize in this congregation, not everybody agrees outside of this congregation. A lot of people react to this teaching. Oh, that's too hard. What about the grace of God? Hey, we believe in the grace of God as much as anybody. But when you get into scriptures and you study what it means to become a Christian, it's serious stuff. It's serious stuff. We've got to get serious. People wonder why there's no real spiritual life in their life. It could very well be because there was no spiritual death that ever took place. If we're going to live, we've got to die first. If we're going to make it to heaven, we've got to step up and do what the scriptures teach. In closing, I just want to tell you a story. It happened many years ago, and Kim probably tells it better than I do, but there was an Asian woman that wanted to become a Christian. I don't know what her nationality was. I don't remember. What I do remember is that she didn't speak English very well. But she was very eager to study the Bible. She was very eager to find out what she needed to do to become a Christian. And so efforts were made to find people that could help her understand Scripture and that spoke her language and they studied with her over a long period of time. And she really got to the point where she understood biblically that she was separated from God because of her sins. And she understood the real meaning of Christian baptism and what she needed to do. She'd never seen a baptism before, but she understood from Scripture what she needed to do. And so finally she said, I need to be baptized. And so the baptism was worked out, it was organized, and everybody gathered together, and there was a big tub of water, and they're all excited about her baptism. And she went in and changed her clothes into what she was going to be baptized in. And as she was coming out, she was talking to the sisters, and she was shaking a lot. And she seemed very afraid. So they pulled her aside and she, they said, are you okay? You know, this is an exciting time. Are, are you sure you're ready to do this? And she says, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready. And they said, well, you seem really afraid. She says, well, everybody's usually a little afraid before they die. She somehow thought her life was literally coming to an end. 
And obviously they held off until they could teach her more completely. <laughs> but you got to admire her courage and her conviction about being willing to die in order to be right with God. We've got way too many people that are going through this life thinking they're right with God, but they never faced death spiritually. They've never gotten in touch with the scriptures and what it really means to be a New Testament Christian, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I want to urge you today, if that's you, then please, please, get into God's Word. There's plenty of men and women in this congregation that will be happy to, to walk you through and teach you from the scriptures. But don't just be coasting along through life, assuming that I'm okay because of this, that, and the other. Really make sure that a true spiritual death has taken place and that you don't minimize the impact of the cross of Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Amen. Father in heaven, today is a time where we focus on the death of your son and it's a very sobering topic. Father, we realize the physical and emotional agony that he went through, but we also realize the spiritual challenges as he took on our sins on the cross. Father, help us to respond in kind. Help us to be eager, to be obedient to the scriptures, to step up and do what we need to do to not minimize the impact of the cross, but to realize that we need to come to a point where we're willing and ready to die as well. Father, thank you for this time. Help us to get the help that we need through your word and through friends and people that can guide us. We love you. We pray through your son. Amen. 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 And I believe at this time, we actually have a baptism to witness. So